And I find that it's harder to, uh, maybe not harder, but it's interesting to try to convince people that those bridges are there because I think we've become in some ways more cynical as a culture and more, and that's a product of being more isolated and, but, you know, having that lack of community, having that lack of a village. Uh, and it's, it's interesting for me to see the relationship between those two things, how one is. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Heart Speaks podcast. I'm your host, Chloe Valdry. This next episode is going to be featuring Jenea Bennett, who is the executive director of the Youth Leadership Foundation based in Washington, D.C. This organization mentors hundreds of young kids across the Washington, D.C. metro area, as well as Maryland. I've really enjoyed my conversation with Jenea, especially as someone who has some background and some experience in volunteering, especially with young people. We talked about the art and craft of mentorship, how to navigate mentorship in really scarce times like COVID-19, and also how to help parents be a part of the process. We spoke about this and other things that are specific to the topic of mentoring young people. And we also spoke especially about the cultivation of agency, which is something, you know, that gets thrown around from time to time as sort of catch-all word. But we wanted to really drill down into what the concept of agency really is in the first place and how to develop it among young talent. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Without further ado, here's Jenea Bennett and I speaking on the Heart Speaks podcast. All righty. So good to be with you today, Jenea. How are you doing today? <laughs> I'm doing great. How are you, Chloe? I'm doing well. I changed yesterday's uh, appointment. I know we were supposed to meet, but yesterday, but I, you know, I was like, technically it's Juneteenth. And so I would like to be off. So <laughs> that's, why I, that's why I changed that. I love that. So I would love to learn more about about what you do, specifically YLF, the Youth Leadership Foundation, and how you got involved and just your journey to that organization. I would love to learn more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the journey probably starts in middle school. Um, okay. You know, I was one of those like awkward, awkward kids. I think we're all awkward in middle school, but yeah. uh, just sort of dealing with yourself, trying to kind of work out your personality um, dealing with conflict with peers. Mm. Um, I just became interested in just human dynamics in general, like when I was a middle schooler. Okay. Um, and how we sort of exist with one another, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I became interested in psychology, was very interested in education, and the, the mixture of those two uh, led me to a lot of youth development pursuits when I was in college. Okay. Um, so a friend of mine, actually, we were at a we were at a messianic Shabbat she, uh, uh, by happenstance, um, and she invited me to participate in a program called PALS. Okay. And I said, no, thank you. I'm actually very busy. I'm doing a lot of tutoring and mentoring programs of my own. I don't have time for an extra one. Um, but she kept pestering me about it, and I ended up um, joining, joining up one summer. Mm -hmm. It was the best summer of my life. Um, okay. I really uh, bonded so closely with these other mentors there. Um, we had uh, a lot of fun in the programs, but outside the programs too, you know, just kind of doing crazy random things I'd never done, like spelunking and just, just developed a bond with these women. Um, and the work that we were doing was really rewarding because uh, we were connecting with young ladies about some of the same issues that I dealt with as a middle schooler. Mm. Um, and so that was my first introduction to Youth Leadership Foundation and their PALS program for young girls. Um, and I just kind of stayed involved. You know, I, um, I was a mentor through uh, from summer all the way through through college. I came back and I, I gave seminars to mentors on, you know, giving them good tips on, on how to work with the young people. Um, and then when it came time to be done with my master's degree, I said, I don't want to do what I studied. I'd rather do this mm -hmm. thing over here. Um, and so I just kind of stayed involved. So um, it's been, goodness, um, 
almost 15 years at this point. Wow. Um, and it's kind of just in my blood. You know, um, YLF, we we support students with, with mentorship, but with the idea of uh, that when you reflect and you form your character, um, the other things follow. Um, and that sort of that central point, that anchor anchor point of your, your life and your existence is your character mm-hmm. and everything else rotates around that. Yeah, so how, that's the why I love the story. How would you define, because I was looking at the values of the organization um, as I was looking at your website, how would you define or describe the process of character building? Because I grew up with, you know, my father was in the military and my mother was very strict and there was a lot of emphasis on character building as well. But yeah. I feel like there's never necessarily been an explicit uh, explanation of what that means in an easy, yeah. you know, memorable snippet that you can take with you on the go so you can easy, easily recall it to memory. So I'm curious, like, right. do you have one of those for yourself or for the, for the people yeah. that you mentor? Yeah, that's a great question because, because, right, it's like, how do you build characters? It's not like you kind of go out and you chop some wood down yeah. and you're like, okay, it's done. <laughs> yeah. I think um, most, for most of us, our experience is that uh, our life circumstances build our character, you know? And, and in a very real way, a lot of times it's suffering or like the difficult experiences that build our character. Mm-hmm. So it's like, what are you guys saying? Are you just like throwing these kids like in a crucible, like yeah. some contrived like struggle, you know? Um, but but I think really what it is, is you're accompanying a young person in their experiences, their very real experiences of struggle or whatever it is, and kind of giving them the words and the tools to assess those experiences in a way that they can kind of build themselves up, you know? Okay. So it's not, it's a cheat word, right? It's like, you're not really building anyone's character. You're really just sort of sitting beside them as mm. they, as life is coming at them you know, yeah. and, and you're helping them to process those things. Mm. Um, and a really kind of powerful example, like there's this one parent who told me once that, you know, before she came to Pals, like I could never talk to her about anything, mm. but when she had a mentor, we could start having conversations, you know, yeah. and that was just sort of an, an entry point for that mom to start to actually have true connections with her daughter. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty powerful. Just like giving people language. It's sort of, it's what you do. It's what you do at, at Theory of Enchantment. It's like you're giving people a language to kind of discuss love, you know? Yeah. yeah, it sounds like what you're saying is you help you help young people make sense of the things that are coming at them. You help them make meaning out of what would otherwise be a chaotic experience, you know, especially when yeah. you're talking about middle school and teenage life in general is a very chaotic, <laughs> you know, <laughs> liminal experience. I'm curious, why do you think that that parent was able to, uh, I guess, open up to her child more after her child was being mentored? What, what was the, what was the change that occurred? Yeah. I mean, so if you kind of think about how some of those conversations go, it's like the mom will be like, Hey, how was your day? You know, or, Mm-mm. you know, if something was upsetting, it's, mm, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you yeah. know, um, and sometimes moms, you know, so it's such a weird experience being a mom myself. Mm-hmm. I, I can understand that the weirdness, it's like you, you've seen your kid kind of in every aspect, like from when they were a baby. Yeah. And then at a certain point you look at them and you realize they have a life of their own. I don't know about. Mm-hmm. And you don't necessarily have the tools to like know how to access that life. You just mm-hmm. kind of want to demand it. Like, give me this yeah. information. <laughs> like, yeah. why don't I know everything about you? anymore? You know? Um, yeah. And so it becomes up to the, the, the child to be able to articulate, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and if they've never learned to, you know, there's just not that opportunity to kind of speak the same language. So I think that's really why it's just, you know, mentorship is a really kind of slow and patient exercise. Mm. You're really having to kind of pull things out slowly and be patient. Yeah. And sometimes, I don't know, I don't know about this mother in particular, but I can only speak for like, sometimes as a mom, I'm not the most patient when trying to get information from my, (laughs) from my kid, you know? That makes a lot of sense. I'm wondering, so I used to volunteer for an organization called Children of Promise. 
which yeah. mentors, which also mentors kids whose parents are incarcerated. And right. it's such a whole system that they've built. Shout out to Sharon Content, who is the uh, founder of that organization. It's such a, it's such an entire system. There's, you know, each student is paired with like a counselor and there's uh, resources even for the parents and it's a whole operation. And I'm wondering if you could describe sort of how this organization operates. Like what are the different functions, yeah. you know, the ins and outs, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, YLF, the, the model is sort of like a, it's a holistic model. So we, we don't just do mentorship. We also do sort of kind of four different zones, um, academic support, what we call character education. Mm-hmm. Um, we do the mentorship piece and then we do, uh, you know, the pillar is that we believe pr- um, parents are the primary educator of their kids. Mm-hmm. So it's like support for parents, sort of like what you're saying. So this is wraparound thing. And each of those categories has its own little set of uh, tricks of the trade. Mm-hmm. So for the character education piece, it's really just sort of conversations about different virtues, you know? Oh, interesting. Um, and it's always a kind of like a tricky thing, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, when you're talking about virtue, you can kind of amplify a virtue to the point of, um, I don't know, neglecting, neglecting other virtues. And then actually that virtue becomes something that's like bad or negative because you're like pushing it too hard. So the virtue conversations like really run the gamut, you know, Mm. like, you know, sometimes we're talking about contentment. Sometimes we're talking about, um, you know, courage and fortitude, you Mm. know, um, Sometimes we're talking about justice, you know, sometimes we're talking about freedom. So the, the mentors are kind of trained to, to give these little nuggets or these mm-hmm. lessons about character. And usually a lot of times it'll center around a story of an individual. And then the mm-hmm. students in a group, this is sort of a group context, can start to engage in a conversation about this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's always pretty fun. Um, and then the mentorship happens one on one. I think something that's unique about YLF is that usually, you know, really strong mentor, mentorship programs have, you have the same mentor, you know, for a year or more. But really, our approach is that even though the context of mentorship is like one-to-one, it's really sort of a community endeavor, because you may have a mentor who's assigned to you for the summer, and you'll see them through the school year, but you might be assigned a different mentor during the school year when you're um, with your group. And the reason for that is for us, what's most important is the tools of mentorship and the context of community. So the tools of mentorship are uh, helping students to kind of reflect and problem solve. You know, Um, you can when you're sitting down to solve a problem, you think of the situation, you think of your your options, you think of the advantages and disadvantages of those options, Mm -hmm. and then you think of the solution. And you have a mentor kind of walk you through that process, you know, after sort of just like hearing you out and hearing your heart. Yeah. And then a lot of it is about goal setting. Like sometimes a, a, sometimes a really kind of innocuous or small goal can really be the thing that shows a young person that they're in control of themselves and their mm-hmm. lives and they have agency, you yeah. know. Um, and that's a really powerful thing, you know. Um, and you can't necessarily just assume that it's going to be taught like magic, you know? Right. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just talk about those two parts of like kind of our holistic approach. Cause that's really where like the mentorship happens is first these character conversations that give you sort of this background knowledge that everyone can kind of come to together. And then you have the mentorship that makes it personal, you know, that you have yeah. some, somebody whose eyes are just on you, you know, for, for half an hour to so 45 minutes of the day, which is, that's such a rare experience, yeah, <laughs> you know, um, sure. in the speed of our culture. But and how frequently? Who are you? Who are your mentors? Who did who you are, like? Who are my mentors? You, yeah. yeah. Um, I was mentored by Brett Stevens in 2015 at the Wall Street Journal. I would say he was my first official mentor, but I also consider a lot of my English professors and teachers in high school to be mentors of a sort because I gravitated towards English literature so much. 
Um, And and English literature really revealed to me human psychology. And I think it's really underrated. It's an underrated subject. But I always, ever since I was in school, actually, even before high school, I remember really gravitating towards my fourth grade English teacher and seeing them as mentors, even even though maybe they didn't see themselves in that way, that's how I received them. Yeah. And like what, what parts of what they did for you just felt like mentorship? Well, when you were talking about virtues, I was thinking of, well, I was thinking of the fact that virtues require um, like a balancing act. Like you said, like you could yeah. over, you could overdo one virtue to the point where it becomes a vice. And yes. And I don't, yes. think, I don't think we're taught, like that ba- like balance is not um it's not like a fixed thing it's not something that it's not like a propositional statement that you just like uh internalize like i am balanced no it actually requires <laughs> right it's like it requires, you're always trying to yeah. Yeah, yeah it requires that constant movement um mm-hmm. which you know can it is exhausting. a dance it is. it is a dance it is a dance I like the metaphor of dance, but one of my English teachers in 10th grade in particular, um, Miss Gill, was very much into taking literature and using literature to teach us about how to live, essentially. So she would take different lessons from the Odyssey and turn those into lifelong lessons that we could apply to our own lives. Um, I think that English literature lends itself to that kind of, yeah. you know, uh, application but that's something that I that I really remember yeah yeah I think the humanities are are so it's it's hard to teach virtue stale right like you you have to kind of have it in the context it it has to be sort of like embodied in a person yeah you know yeah do you find Mm -hmm. that it's not taught in that way mostly in your experience I, I find that we do kind of strip it away. You know, we, we talk about things in, ab- in abstractions. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's really what makes it hard for people to sort of um, like internalize it. And like the yeah. most powerful examples of like a virtue in your own life are when you're thinking of a person, you know, mm-hmm. like, so a lot of times our starting point, um, you know, a lot of times a young, you know, young men and young women, they always point to their mom, you know, mm-hmm. and they talk about yeah. like, they talk about like what, what their mom did that made them, you know, that inspired them. Yeah. You know, inspirational figure is like their mom or their teacher, like you're saying. Mm-hmm. But it's always like these embodied versions of right. whatever the virtue is, you know? Yeah, it has um, to be lived out. It can't be, like you said, abstract. There's a lot of, there's, a, there's this tendency to abstract things a lot that I'm realizing is a long standing part of our culture. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't resonate with people. It ha- things have to be contextualized in order for it to re- yeah. in order for it to make sense. It has to be contextualized. So, yeah. what about you? What who have some of your mentors um, been in your life? I'm like um, I'm greedy this way because like I make everybody a mentor somehow. <laughs> okay. Oh, <laughs> like, that's cool I, though. I like that. Yeah. That's a cool idea. Yeah. yeah. Like you, you got you have to sort of you can always kind of like draw value from the people you meet, you know, like Mm -hmm. your people are inspired. But like, if, if I'm thinking of like actual mentors, like people who have sort of taken on that role and been consistent, um, the first one that I met that was like this was, no, I take that back. Okay. Wait. So I'll start with, um, a a colleague of my mom. My mom was a teacher Mm -hmm. and one of her colleagues, um, took me sort of under her wing and I started, um, tutoring her third grade students when I was in middle school or something like that. So she was my first one. And she was like a, she was, she was so knowledgeable. Like she always had um, like, she was just dropping knowledge all the time. Like some historical figure, you know, that like, and, and, and she was demanding too. She was, Mm -hmm. she was saying like, you know, um, you, you need to do things with excellence, you know, yeah. and she would always have this kind of stern approach to, and I was like, yeah, I do need yeah. to do things with excellence. <laughs> so yeah. she was the first one. Um, and then I think the one that sort of was like officially in that role and still kind of exists this way is a woman who I met through YLF. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes their board of directors will do the summer interviews for the, um, you know, for the summer mentors. Mm-hmm. And so she interviewed me. And in the process, we developed a relationship. So oh, when cool. I was in college, she would kind of take me out um, for coffee and we would chat about life and, you know, my struggles and yeah. relationships and all that kind of stuff. Um, and she was always very um, frank with me, which I appreciated. Like she never, <laughs> Uh, she never tried to shield me from the truth or always tell me that I was 100% awesome. Right. You know, yeah, she yeah, pointed yeah. things out to me that were areas of growth, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of, I don't know, it's difficult to find that. A lot of mm-hmm. people will kind of hype you yeah. and tell you all the things you want to hear. Yeah. Um, but it's it's hard to see yourself if if someone doesn't reflect every aspect of you, highlight and shade, you know? Sure. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you do you think there's a way or let me ask the question differently. How does one cultivate mentorship, meaning not necessarily joining an organization or being a part of an organization, yeah. but like in their everyday life? How do, how does a person do that? So you mean like um, on the receiving end, on the giving end. or just or say it again? on the giving end, on the giving end. Um, I think the easiest way to cultivate mentorship is interest and consistency. Mm. You know, um, you have to kind of make space for people and be consistent with it, you know? Yeah. Um, and a lot of times, I think the hardest thing is realizing that you have a space to mentor people. And then I think another hard part is, is thinking that well, maybe you don't have the tools necessary to be able to give to somebody else. Yeah. But just by virtue of like your humanity, like you have something to bring to someone else, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that, I think just the regularity, you know, Mm -hmm. constantly pursuing the the relationship with someone. Yeah. Um, And in my case, you know, uh, Reyes to me, she she always was just consistent. You know, even when I was kind of flighty and all over the place, she was like, "Hey, let's get coffee." Mm-hmm. You know? yeah, 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 that's cool. Yeah. And so, do you think? I'm I'm curious to get your take or your experience, mm-hmm. learn more about your experience on dealing with parents and yeah. what that's like. And yeah, what is that like? Because I was talking to a few. I was talking to a parent the other day who was having trouble with a school, the curriculum that a school was like promoting or something like that. And there's so many dynamics in that ecosystem. There are the students, there's the parent, there's the parents, and then there's the teachers and staff. And then sometimes what the teacher and the staff want doesn't overlap with what the parents want. And so how do you navigate that? How does that, number one, how does that come up within this context and how do you navigate that? Yeah. Oh, that's a biggie. Um, there's so many. So I love our parents at YLF. And I think that particularly like through the pandemic, like yeah. we bonded so close because, you know, a lot of times parents, they'll hear what you're doing through their kid. You know, like you, they're, they're there at a Saturday program or after school program. They'll hear the stories. Yeah. But the pandemic, it was like they were actually hearing it, you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. in real time. Um. And that that kind of developed a, a degree of rapport with the parents, mm. you know. Um, but so what you're saying is a very real thing. Um, I think that there is such a. OK, let's see, how can I distill this idea? I think that for a while now, there's been a trend in which parents have been outsourcing some of their responsibilities to schools. Mm. Um, Some of it has been expedient and some of it has been, well, because this is what I need to do to help my kids who excel. excel. Mm -hmm. And so as things are shifting or there's sort of conflict between the parent sphere and the the schooling sphere, parents are trying to reclaim Mm -hmm. that position again as like, I am the the authority over my child. You know, Mm -hmm. parents parents need to be sort of re-empowered Mm-hmm. And sort of reinvigorated at this this idea that I am not only responsible for my child, but I'm a competent person that can guide them. Mm-hmm. You know, I am the steward of mm-hmm. of my child. You know, yeah. and and I need to if I'm not equipped in some way, I need to equip myself in a way that serves serves my child. You know, 
Um, the same, so on the other side, because, you know, as we talk about balance, um, you also experience those parents that, um, that don't want to give their kids over to anything that would, would mean any amount of risk. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think for those parents, you know, uh, you know, that's, that story, that really dicey story in the Bible about Isaac and, yeah. uh, you know, the, the sacrifice of Isaac. Yeah. If you think of it, that story, like symbolically, it's like being willing to sacrifice your child over to something, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Um, and knowing that that children are sort of anti-fragile, mm-hmm. like there's a lot of ideas out there now, like John, um, Jonathan Haidt and um, and and others who are talking about parents' risk aversion and yeah. how we sort of need to kind of give our kids over. Um, so it really kind of depends on the situation. I don't know the situation right. that you encountered, but it could be one of the two things. It could be the parent kind of fighting for their their correct position mm-hmm. as, you know, I, I have authority yeah. and I'm, I'm taking ownership of my parenting. Or it could be parents that are like, you know, helicoptering and yeah, not yeah, yeah. allowing their children to explore. And I encounter both, you know, I encounter both types and I'm gentle with it too, because I sort of, I have sort of this direct experience now of like, Mm -hmm. you know, giving your kid over is risky endeavor, you know? I definitely grew up with the former. (laughs) (laughs) Who are very much like, I am the sole authority over my child's future. (laughs) Um, But in a way, ironically, that can become a kind of risk averse orientation, right? It's a right. different kind of risk, but it is a risk averse orientation. And yeah, it sounds like you're saying overall that parents should take on the mantle of mentorship. And, and because when I when I hear the term steward, steward and mentor are for me kind of the same same types. Um, so it sounds like what you're saying is that parents need to take on that responsibility seriously but a mentor or steward is very different from someone who mistakenly believes that they can you know dictate the absolute future of the child it requires recognizing i imagine it requires recognizing that the child is their own person <laughs> and you know just, just like surprise I, surprise yeah I don't know the ins and outs of my parents lives before you know I was born and even to to today I, there, there will always be a mystery at the heart of every being right and that includes children as well so it sounds like what you're saying is that parents need to learn how to recognize that and it's hard because if you weren't taught that you know then why would you know know that or how would you know that yeah, I mean, so there's, you know, there's a lot of kind of cultural reasons for why people parent the way they do, you mm-hmm. know. Um, you know, my mom, she likes to say, I'm still your mother. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like, that's her, that, that is too. totally her vibe. My mom totally says that too, yeah. Yeah, you know, and it's, yeah. I mean, it's like, I'm trying to think of her mom and like how mm. she parented and like what the context was and like what the stakes were, Yeah, you know. So it's like, all right, I have my kid, they're living in this society where there's um you know pre 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 integration there's sort of like a a community that yeah. that you can kind of like count on like all right this is our our yeah, space yeah, to yeah. be but when you go outside you need to act this way yeah. and there can't be a question about it and you know like there's right, this yeah. kind of yeah, air reflexive no, kind of fear there's no room <laughs> yeah right you know yeah. and then so I'm thinking of my mom and she's raising her kids and they're coming up you know like we grew up southeast dc mm-hmm. and it's like you know not not the safest environment her reflexive tendency is to be i need to make sure my kids are safe you know right. this is what needs to happen kind of thing right um but y- you sort of realize is that like all right well now that i'm becoming a parent the context is a lot different for my kids but the the patterns that i sort of um absorb you know that just sort of I didn't even do, it's like by osmosis. I didn't think of any of this stuff. I had all these grand ideas, (laughs) you know, about how a parent, all this stuff starts squeezing back out, you know, and it's a conscious effort to kind of like, all right, let me reframe this. Like, how do I, how do I do this? You know? 
Yeah. And it's, um, it's tricky. It's like, it requires so much kind of conscious thought and, mm. and not just sort of the insights, but then also like, all right, well, I've taken these insights and I'm making them like real, you know, that's mm. the sort of really tricky part of like, how do I change, you know, mm. because it's not as though that thing didn't have a function. I don't need to judge it, right. but what I'm doing now doesn't need to be that, you know? Right. And it's, um, it's all about context, like we were saying earlier, switching context. And also, it's important to recognize and appreciate the fact that our parents and their parents were responding to uh, the unknown and the way the unknown manifested in their day is very different from how it manifests in our day. But, right. still, but still, there will always be some sort of fight or flight mechanism that, you know, is millions of years old in our system, <laughs> you know, that can take over at any mm-hmm. given point in time. And so it's important to, I think, show ourselves grace for our shortcomings yeah. and also try to model that for other people, whether it's people that we're mentoring or whether it's children that we have. And that's, that can be very hard. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, no. it's, it's a constant, it's a, I mean, I'm doing a lot of work to work on myself at the moment, deliberately and consciously. And it's a lot. So I can only imagine, <laughs> I can only imagine having a child. You yeah. Know? It's, it's, it's a fun journey because, yeah. you know, so you, you have all these theories and they're, they're actually, it's like good stuff. So like I yeah. was a, I was like a, an AJ before I was a, a mom, like a, okay. a Janae, you know, okay, yeah, yeah. and I was Miss Janae at the, at the programs all the time, you know, yeah. um, and I have like all these like big, big thoughts, um, but then being able to, like with my kids, it's, it's been, so, it really has been a challenge, like mm-hmm. learning and growing, you know, to enact these things when the stakes are, you know, this is actually like my, my progeny, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, you feel so protective over it. Yeah. So like, how do you like let go? you know, in order to sort of allow, because kids are so resilient, Mm -hmm. but we say that in the abstract when we're talking about other people's kids are resilient. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know, so it's, um, I think for me, um, what I'm learning is that just with, with the pace of like modernity, like Mm hypernovelty, there are things that I know that are, will be completely irrelevant you know, to, to my kids in terms of like, actually like how things are done. Mm. And the real thing that I need to pass on is just sort of, you know, the, the consciousness about principles of wisdom that are timeless, you know, yeah. and it, in as much as I'm trying to sort of impose, like, you know, things that are unhelpful, like, this is what you have to do. You have to go this way and then this way. And, you know, go to college and get a job. And then, yeah. you know, uh, like all these things, they, they may not be like right. the relevant, the relevant operative principles by which, you know, a, a, a child will succeed. Mm-hmm. But if I teach them a principle about, you know, um, work, work well and intentional, mm-hmm. you know, like that won't, that won't fail them. Right. Or if I teach them to sort of understand yourself as an individual first, mm-hmm. you know, um, that that idea won't fail them, you know. Right. Um, and knowing that the way that I learned was through observation and like seeing people mm-hmm. enact that, that puts a higher standard on like what I do personally. So it's like mm-hmm. honestly, all these lessons, it's really about like your life, like your yeah. life, the way you live it is the lesson, you know. Yeah. Um, For me, you know, I'm learning about myself that I'm a huge fan of Carl Jung and many of Carl Jung's colleagues in addition to Carl Jung himself, talked about these four ways of being or seeing or being in the world. And they include intuiting, thinking, sensing, and feeling. And by Okay, thinking, this is like Myers-Briggs. Yeah, yeah. So Myers-Briggs like came out of that whole system. And feeling does not actually mean what we think it means or what we hear usually because we confuse feeling and sensing. But yeah. feeling actually means valuing. Like, I like this, I don't like this. I like this, I right. don't. Right. And one of the things I've learned about myself is that I would like to work on my sensing and my feeling modes, if you will. I grew up in a very intellectual house. I have the thinking down pack. 
right? <laughs> I, <laughs> and I have the intuiting part down pat. And the intuitive piece can can go go well or can go poorly because the intuiting piece is about not necessarily things that are rooted in reality, right? And I grew up in a, in a house that was both hyper-intellectual and hyper-religious. And the combination of those things, in a, in a, in a way, had, a, had an impact on me such that it sometimes took me out of reality. In other words, it took me away from that sensibility to learn from observation. Because if I was assuming certain, like you were saying, do this and do this and do this. And, you know, if, if I was assuming that that was the end all be all, then I would, I would actually avoid obser- observing and learning from observation because it's already- There's no necessity. Yeah. Right. And everything is already, I know how this is going to go already, right? I can predict it. Um, and so, but I, but I've in fact always had a sensing function. It's just been underdeveloped. And now I'm trying to learn how to, and the feeling part, how to lean into more of that and to develop that and exercise that muscle. Yeah, yeah. No, that's an interesting idea. You know, and I've, I've been playing with something similar. Um, mm. I've had a different kind of journey towards it. But my, uh, my grad school advisor, um, we, you know, I study school psychology, which is basically uh, you, uh, you administer tests to students to refer mm-hmm. them for special education services. Okay. So this is like the department. And within that department, he has a, my advisor, Gary Godfrinson, um, had a, kind of like a speciality or like a special way of looking at things. And it was action oriented research, you know, because mm-hmm. he believed that like, okay, well, it's nice to make all these theories can you apply it in a context and see how it works, you know? Yeah. So I think that that's a way of kind of taking some of the principles, you know, that, that you learn some of these like sort of deep and timeless wisdom. Like how do you take those ideas and then just sort of apply it in the context, you know, and um, really like fully commit to the idea and test it and see how it works out, you know? Yeah. Um, almost in taking sort of a scientific approach to it and like observing how people mm-hmm. react, you know, mm-hmm. um, like, does this work? And um, I think that the goal setting thing is a really uh, easy way to do that. You know, mm-hmm. we had one student um, and they were having a lot of conflict with uh, their, their grandparent who is a mm-hmm. primary caretaker. Always angry. She's always so mean, <laughs> you know, like that was, the, that was the talk. And then that, you know, the kind of assessing, okay, well, what, what's going on there with grandmother? Okay. Well, she's stressed out, you know, the money's short, the, the house is messy. All right. Well, I can't really do anything about the stress or the money situation, but maybe the house messy thing, maybe that's something I could do something to help with. Mm. And then the kid says, all right, well, I'm going to wash the dishes for every day for a week and see what happens, you know? Yeah. So now they're tinkering with the idea of like, can I contribute something that will then kind of impact my grandmother and how she, how she is, you know, right. and it, it, it did, it totally worked. Yeah. You know, this grandmother is now like very pleased with this young person. Their, their, their dynamic is improving and they're changing mm. their existence just from this principle that we are operating from. Like, Hey, we're here to, to serve the people around us. Yeah. That's theory. But then setting a goal about actually doing it, that's yeah. practice. And then you're seeing like, all right, well, this idea doesn't come from nowhere. There's, mm. there's something to it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's really, it's really difficult to bring life to those kinds of things. If they're just, you, you don't really have a space to test anything. Right. You know? Right. Um, no, the practice is definitely key and it's hard to have the courage or the space to test things out. If you, if you are if you are raised to believe that there are certain truths that are like if you're raised to believe that certain virtues are true in the abstract sense of the word not in the practical sense of the word Mm -hmm. right if you like i remember i and ironically uh, i realized that my upbringing actually did lend itself to practice ultimately but I i do remember um, thinking 
at a time that like just the rote memorization of certain, you know, aphorisms or wise sayings is actually not enough. (laughs) You know, it has to be applied in a context and the context change the flavor of the statement itself. Right. And you get to see, like you were saying, those shades and those gradations, but it, it has to be put into a container. Otherwise it, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, it slides off like Teflon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It has yeah. to be put into a container. Otherwise it won't come to life. And there's like a, there's a whole metaphor there, but <laughs> so, yeah, you know, um, I'm curious, what are some of the challenges and struggles that you experienced during COVID as you know, in the position that you were in? Yeah, um, it was a tricky time. I think the biggest struggle was that we didn't have the capacity to serve as many students as we wanted to, mm. just because the, you know, some of the work that we do is in a group context. Right. And so we were just like limited spatially, like by space, we were limited. And then just sort of um, having to flip to virtual, like that mm. was, that was tricky for us. We had, okay, well, how do we deal with the monitoring issue? There was just like, oh practical kind of exigencies we had to figure out um but it was a fun it was a fun challenge in that um I don't know challenges are fun it's like an opportunity to kind of yeah. all right where, where am I at like yeah. you know how's this thing working out so and, and then like I said like it, it just gave us the opportunity to to deepen some of the work um mm. you know so there was some practical bumps but I think ultimately our community was, was really strengthened by the adversity that we experienced, you know, some really kind of tender moments, you know, Mm -hmm. being able to, to, to see people through some, some challenges there, you know, not every household is like a two parent household, you know? Um, so you have a a mom that's, um, working a full-time job and having to sort of negotiate the zoom thing, which, you know, like zoom school is, you know, every teacher will tell you suboptimal. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and so to have somebody to come in and then be, you know, with their, their son, th- this story in particular, this mom, she lives in a, a, a two bedroom apartment that is sort of like above a highway. Mm. And so even when she would open her windows, you would get like dust and like yeah. from the highway and like the sound and the noise. So, and then she's in this apartment building this pretty tight and it was like early COVID. So nobody was going anywhere, you know, like not even to like the playground. And she was stuck in the house with this, you know, growing boy. That's just like, he's got a lot of energy. Yeah, It was very stressful time for her, you know, very stressful time. And she came to, to tears, just telling me like what it meant to have his mentor come on, you know, um, talk with him, like be with him, talk about his stresses so that it, Mm -hmm. It's like a buffer, right? It's is this ability of someone to just listen to you objectively. Yeah. They'll be on the side of mom, but at the same time is able to just kind of hear you vent about mom. Yeah. Mom is not gonna listen to you vent about mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not gonna happen. Yeah. But it's it's like just it's that opportunity, you know, to have someone to to just be with you and be for you, mm-hmm. but also be for your family. You know, and that 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 was just such a powerful experience um, for a number of these families, you know, yeah. and it's something that I'll treasure even as we sort of move on and we're kind of returned uh, to form with a lot of our programs. It's it's a it's like those are precious memories to me, you know. Yeah. You said something interesting just now about, you know, mentors and their their stresses. How do you navigate stress that a mentor has or you know, yeah. people who are, you know, stewarding these, these young kids, how do you navigate that? Yeah, that is sort of like the hidden secret of YLF is that, you know, even as we're doing all this good stuff for the, for the young people. And I, I, I know this from direct experience, like we mentors get poured into, you know? Mm. Um, and it's like, we have a very kind of layered organization. Okay. My, um, you know, my, my lead staff, and um, our director of character mentorship, every Thursday, we kind of meet together and we kind of have like a book that we'll go through or like a topic that we'll discuss um, to just sort of like unpack, you know, things that we're we're going through or or solidify ideas that we're trying to trying to figure figure out. 
Mm. Um, most recently, we were talking about just like integration of yourself. You know? Oh my so, goodness, like, I talk about this all the time. Go ahead. <laughs> right? So it's like, you know, the way that we've we framed it is like you have the intellect, mm. you have your heart, and you have the will, you know? And the intellect is like all this kind of cool, rational, like what you were talking about before, this kind of yeah. rational perspective, needed perspective. Yeah. You have the heart, which is like your emotions. And your emotions are such a powerful source of beauty and like how you understand the world, you know? But the thing is, in, in many ways, like your emotions are a voice. They give voice to a lot of things, but they're not necessarily the people that need to be in the driver's seat, you know? So it's like, sure. and then your will, it's like all these things. So you know all this stuff and you feel all these things but what are you doing, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's like the integration of those, those three things, like make for a holistic and integrated self, you know? Yeah. And so we're talking about these things as a lead staff, like, and we're, we're drawing out personal examples from our own lives, you know, mm -hmm. being vulnerable with each other. Um, and then that sort of kind of goes down into uh, the staff that these, that these directors then leave, you know, mm -hmm. and then they take that to the mentors and then the mentors take that to the kids, you know? Yeah. That's great. So it's a constantly sort of moving experience in the sense that all layers of the organization are going through some kind of growth and development. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lauren Hill said anything that that isn't growing is dying, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like we to be growing, you know? Yeah. Um, that's, that great. Cool. that's great. I, I think about these things as someone who's building my own organization and you know, theory of enchantment is is certainly in a position to steward people, you know, and simultaneously thinking about how do I and my team continue to mentor each other, to be there for each other, to be a container for each other, encourage each other to be vulnerable with one another so that yeah. we can sustain it. Because without that piece, I don't think it would be sustainable. You can get burnout, you know, you can get um, overwhelmed by your own stresses and it's yeah. super super important for the staff to have a support team as well as the kids that they're mentoring so I'm really happy to hear that you have something like that in place especially now yeah. in our crazy I don't know I don't know if it's technically post-COVID I like to say it's post-COVID <laughs> like what space are we I'm in <laughs> hoping that it's post-COVID but yeah, that's really important. And I do, I wonder if you come across this, actually. You know, they say it takes a village. And there are some people who are turned off by that statement. Um, and I'm wondering if you encounter that. And if not, that's fine. But I, I've been thinking about that, that whole dynamic for a while, especially in the context yeah. of mentoring young people. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I have never heard of anybody being turned off by this. Mm. I, I need to know more about this. Like, who's turned off by this phrase? <laughs> it's usually, unfortunately, whatever, it's usually in a political context okay. um, that people are turned off by it. And what they do, like, people who some are, some are often conservative and they take it to its most extreme position and they basically say oh if you think that then you must be like a communist or something <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah they think it's a most extreme position it's probably it's only, funny I, yeah I, my perception is that folks that that have that they're probably detached from um it's interesting because i i've seen this idea come up in um, across the political spectrum as, as something that's vital, like this sense of community. Right, right. So I think it's paradox. maybe just like language translation. Yeah. You know, so if you say, like, if you talk about maybe like the principle of subsidiarity, and you mm -hmm. say that to a con somebody who's conservative, like, oh, yes, I understand that. Yeah. You say you take a, a village, maybe. Yeah. You know, somebody <laughs> on the other end. It's like, it, if it's a truth, it's a truth, you know, yeah. and you it'll emerge in its own way, like wherever you are. It's just trying to find like, well, what is the, you know, um, corpus, I mean, you know, like, like, how do you connect the two ideas? Like, how do you make the language connect, you know? Yeah. And sure. I love, that's why I love like theory of enchantment. Cause it is, it's like, you know, um, 
there's like, it's what you're talking about is like, you create like a connection point to something through yeah. love, you know? Um, and I, I like that. I like that so much about what you do. And my, um, so, you know, my husband, my husband's white and he grew up in Connecticut mm-hmm. and his dad, um, you know, he grew up, I guess his, his parents were like Lithuanian or something like that. So he didn't really have many entry points. Like I'm talking about my, my, my husband's dad. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were Lithuanian. And his first sort of introduction to sort of black culture was through jazz music, yeah. you know, and, and just sort of that, like that influence, you know, yeah. just like sort of like a, you're sort of like getting some kind of anchor point to love, like some hook, you know, that drives you deeper into something. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that that probably exists in more places than we realize. If you mm. just sort of like, you know, find a find a connection point, find something to love, you know, yeah. and then you, you can kind of make and drive those connections, you know. Yeah. Finding that bridge is super critical. And I find that it's harder to uh maybe not harder but it's interesting to try and convince people that those bridges are there because i think we've become in some ways more cynical as a culture and more and that's a product of being more isolated and but you know having that lack of community having that lack of a village uh and it's it's interesting for me to see the relationship between those two things how one impacts the other and especially when it comes to the arts which you know is heavily used throughout theory of enchantment as that bridge. It's, it can be tricky to, to see, like when I'm giving workshops, for example, it's interesting to tell, to be able to tell who the cynical people are in the room (laughs) and who the optimistic (laughs) people are. And, you know, cynicism changes the energy in the room. And, you know, I'm learning how to navigate that and transmute that energy and, you know, <laughs> transform that energy, carry that energy, midwife that energy into something else. <laughs> um, but cynicism yeah. is a big problem or challenge, I'd say, in the space that that I'm dealing in at the moment. Yeah, yeah. So, like, what are your, um, what have you found to work, like, as you're tinkering in real time, you know? I found that if someone is coming from a paradigm where there's the the way, the lens to which they view the world is just like, there are these people over here who are are oppressors and there are these people over here who are oppressed. And like, that's the one binary that they see all of life through. And I'm giving a workshop. So I'm talking about not stereotyping people and not caricaturing people. And, and yeah, So far, everyone who I've spoken to agrees with that. (laughs) (laughs) Theory and practice. Yeah. So, right. So when they, when they bring up things that are that one binary way of viewing the world, I can ask them, well, but isn't that still a stereotype? Like you're still (laughs) caricaturing people by limiting them to that one paradigm. And often they, they have responded by saying, oh, that, yeah, I can see that. Like they can, they can you point. know, um, but yeah, it's, it's trial and error. Yeah. <laughs> and it's also like, <laughs> like being aware of my own energy when that energy is brought into the room. Cause something happens. I'm a, like I said, I'm a very sensing person, even though I haven't yeah. fully developed that. I'm a very sensing person. I feel it in my stomach. I feel it in my gut when the energy is off. And yeah. so learning how to like I don't necessarily want to interrupt the flow of what I'm doing like I can address you after you know in the and when we have a conversation in the question and answer section but at the same time I'm feeling some kind of way and that's going to impact how I present this right yeah so it's a learning process it's interesting because I think let me see if I can kind of like say this idea succinctly but so just like it can work that, um, you know, like people's like love of Disney or like, you know, love of Kendrick Lamar or, you know, like these pop, if there's sort of a place, something that, that the cynics, you know, something that they love, love, like trying to like, like, what do you love? You know, like what's, (laughs) what what gets you sort of like jazz, you know? And I noticed that like when I encounter um, people that have a hard time 
getting out of this sort of like dichotomy, like us, them, us, them, Mm -hmm. they don't, they, they sometimes struggle because they don't really have that many entry entry points or exposures. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this really great book that I never read called why are the, all the black kids eating together in the cafeteria? Mm -hmm. Still on my bucket list to read. I'm going to read it. (laughs) But I feel like the most of the contents in the title (laughs) is like, it talks about this issue of self-segregation, you know? And I think that both in your story and then in in some other, uh, like you had an experience of uh, being a, exposed to a lot of sort of Jewish customs and traditions yeah. that sort of gave you an entry point, like something of interest that like you made into your own family tradition, you know, yeah. and it, it kind of creates this um like complexity, like Mm -hmm. you have like this interior complexity that helps you to see, well, if like, if the sound that I'm hearing, like the the narrative that I'm hearing, um, like about like what black people should be, or like what the monolith is like, well, actually this experience is different. And I can see that inside I'm complex. Like, well, then maybe somebody else is complex. Yeah. And it, but it happened because it was like all mixed into like it wasn't just a one thing. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I know I'm not being clear, but it's like creates this ability for you to synthesize other things, you know, right. because you're having to do that synthesis work because there's like this this complex experience you grew up with, you right? Know? Right. Um, and I say that because, like, I think I had sort of like a similar experience to you, where, you know, I was like, I was the kid that, you know, when somebody called our house for my sister they say, who is this white girl that opened your, uh, like picked up your phone? You know, like I had that experience, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and just sort of like this layering, like you, I think you have to, in order to like, in, in mainstream culture, a lot of things like in, in black culture are introduced. And so they're kind of like absorbed, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But if you're, if you are growing up in a context where, you know, everyone looks like you and you have to sort of make the effort to kind of go outside to, to find something to love. Mm-hmm. Well, then that becomes really difficult, you know? Right. Right. Um, Cause that's, that's a greater, I mean, both are, both come with their own risks, but th- there's a, there's definitely a, a, an acute risk to going out of your bubble when and I realized that there was a loophole in how I grew up in that it was, it contained the seed of curiosity, meaning it valued curiosity implicitly because it was yeah. so different from a lot of the other mainstream experiences that other people have had. And so by definition, it implicitly valued curiosity, the act of being curious about something. So even if I wanted to, break away from that experience later on in life, which I did to a certain extent, I still carry the seed of curiosity with me. Yeah. Whereas if curiosity was never a value for you growing up, then, and in fact was actually, you know, looked down upon, then it's right, that yeah. much more, uh, it can be that much more terrifying actually to go out on your own and take that step outside of the boundary. Yeah, yeah. And then not as many sort of clear ways. Like, so for example, you know, um, being like country music curious. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's certain places you're not allowed to like country music. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, so just like these kinds of things. It's like, yeah. how do you sort of create bridges just by the, the basis of like enjoying things? For my dad, he really liked... Um, theater like in like Mm. movies and things you know so that was like his like entry point to like enjoying you know enjoying um or like his 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 entry point to enchantment with something Mm. yeah that's cool yeah Yeah. Yeah. for me it was I I had to memorize Maya Angelou's poems in uh first grade so (laughs) that was really the beginning of enchantment of my enchantment journey um and yeah we all have to find those entry points you know i think i think to live a more enriched life we have to find those entry points that that give us permission to be curious and yeah. i think it's important to point out that the root word of curious is cura 
which, which comes from the word care, to care about something. And um, that's what we really ultimately have to learn how to do is to care for one another, you know? Yeah. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, this seems like a good place to stop. Do you have, before I stop, do you have any uh, parting words that you like to share with the audience? Yeah. Um, I, I think I'll just say lead with care, lead with love. Um, and, uh, and I think that's a good place to start. Awesome. Thank you, Janaya. Thank you for joining the Heart Speaks podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Chloe.